Today I'd like to use the latest IPCC report to talk about climate on Earth, and in particular four questions. First of all, how, is, how has climate changed in the past? What caused the changes that have been evident? What will happen to climate in the future? And to what extent will humans influence future climate? I should say it's a fantastic turnout. It's great to see so many people interested in science. Although I suppose really might start becoming here to throw rock and fruit at us. But if you, if you are here to throw fruit, please wait for the other panelists to come up on the stage. <laughs> so let's begin by examining the past. The very first thing I wanted to show you was a record of atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration. And this is for the pre industrial period, before the industrial revolution began. And it shows an enormous amount of naturally occurring variability all the way back 800,000 years ago. So this is um, each, so it starts off at 800,000 years ago through to just before the Industrial Revolution. And you can see that just through natural processes alone, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere vacillated between values of something like 200 parts per million up to about 280 parts per million. How do we know this? We know it through some very clever, impressive science where people, scientists and others, visit Antarctica and Greenland and drill deep ice cores and then they analyse what's in the air bubbles trapped inside those long uh, ice cores. And so we're left with magnificent records like the one you see before you. So what's been happening since the Industrial Revolution began? So this is on a different time scale, a very, very different time scale, from 1750 on the left through to 2010 only on the right. There's been further increases since then. And you can see that it started off around about 280 parts per million, and now it's exceeding 380, and now it's moved on close to 400 parts per million in recent times. So how do we actually compare these two plots? This one, which extends for approximately 260 years, and the previous slide, which extended over a period of 800,000 years. Well, in order to make that comparison, we have to squeeze this plot up a little bit. Actually, quite a lot. In fact, you can't squeeze it up enough. But if you, you get a clearer idea of what's actually happened. And so there was this meandering or this vacillation prior to the Industrial Revolution. And then once the Industrial Revolution began, the concentration of carbon dioxide, CO2, in the atmosphere spiked up. And the really impressive thing from this plot is that, that the values that we have now are higher than have been experienced for at least 800,000 years. And of course, Homo sapiens haven't been on the planet that long. And so that means that the CO2 concentrations we currently have are higher than have been experienced by Homo sapiens that have come before us. And if that, that must be one of the most important scientific facts that's ever been uh, uncovered. So that's carbon dioxide, and at the same time, in more recent times, we've also seen an increase in global average temperature, global average surface temperature. This shows at the top, it shows a time series of global average temperature anomalies from 1850 through to the near present. And in everyday language, anomalies are sometimes mean all something weird's going on. In this context, we mean it to, to be the difference between the global average temperature and a reference value. And in this case, the reference value is the average global mean surface temperature over the period 1961 to 1990. So values below that grey dashed line uh, indicate that the temperature of the Earth was, at the surface was lower than that average, and values above that grey line indicate that the temperature of the Earth was above the reference value. And so you can see that there's been lots and lots of year-to-year -year changes, decade-to-decade -decade changes, but there's been an increase to higher temperatures in the last 50 years or so. The plot underneath shows something very similar. It's decadal average temperatures of exactly the same variable. And you can see that, again, there's lots of vacillations, a lot of that due to natural processes. There's also been an increase in temperature, in decadal average temperatures, over the last 30 years. And in fact, the first decade of the 21st century is the highest decadal temperature in the instrumental record. <laughs> now, what's causing all of these bumps and wiggles in the time series? Some of that is due to volcanic eruptions that modify the climate system and lead to a temporary cooling of the planet. 
Some of it's due to what scientists, climate scientists, refer to as naturally occurring internal variability. So this internal variability is things, includes things like the El Nino sub-oscillation, which includes El Nino and La Nina. If you get an El Nino, that can lead to a short-term warming of the planet. If you get a La Nina, it can lead to a short-term cooling of the planet. And there are internal processes, something like the Intercalar Pacific Oscillation, for example, that can lead to these transient warmings and transient coolings um, in the climate system. Now, we've so far looked at CO carbon dioxide, we've also looked at global average surface temperature. What else has changed in the climate system? This plot provides a quick summary of other things that have changed in the climate system. So if we begin from the top left, you can see that sea ice in the Arctic has diminished in its extent. Water vapour averaged over the whole world has increased. Air temperature, not just at the surface, but at the lower few kilometres in the troposphere, have increased. The glacial volume averaged over the whole world has decreased. Temperatures over land have increased. Snow cover has tended to reduce. Sea level has increased, and the amount of heat contained in the ocean has actually increased, and the temperatures over in the air over the ocean have increased, and the sea surface temperature itself has also increased. So all of these changes are consistent with the idea that the planet is warming up. So on the one hand we have these increases in carbon dioxide, and on the other hand we have all these indicators of a warming planet. Why is it that scientists put these two things together? Well, that connection comes through the greenhouse effect. And there are many experts in the audience, but let me just very briefly go through the basics of the greenhouse effect. So we have radiation coming from the sun through the atmosphere, and then it hits the surface of the earth, and the surface of the earth warms up. And as the surface of the earth warms up, it gives off long wave radiation. And a lot of that long wave radiation passes through the atmosphere and goes back out to outer space, cooling the planet off. But because the atmosphere contains so called greenhouse gases, some of that long wave radiation is absorbed by these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The atmosphere then itself warms up, and as it warms up, it too gives off long wave radiation. Some of that long wave radiation will go to outer space, but some of it will come back down. To the surface of the Earth. And so the surface of the Earth is receiving a double whammy, if you like. It's receiving the radiation directly from the Sun, and it's receiving this long wave radiation from the Earth, uh, from the atmosphere. Sorry. And so what we've been doing, what humans have been doing through burning of fossil fuels, through land use change, for example, is increasing concentrations of these greenhouse gases. So what that does is it strengthens that second whammy. And so, as a consequence, the planet warms up. Now, in order to determine the magnitude of that warming, it's not something you can do on the back of an envelope. You can try to do it on the back of an envelope, but you're probably not going to be too successful. So you really need to take into a whole host of different processes. You need to take into account that there's a huge ocean out there. You need to take into account that you've got clouds. It could be wind changes. It could be a reduction in sea ice or an increase in evaporation, for example. All of these things play a role in ultimately determining what the response of the planet will be to increase in greenhouse gases that have been caused by human activities. And we're very, very fortunate to have, based on developments and advances in mathematics, in science and in technology, over hundreds of years, literally, that enable us to simulate the climate system. So these climate models, Earth system simulated models, encapsulate much of the physics of the climate system in mathematical form. So they allow us to do a number of things. One of the things they allow us to do is to improve our understanding of what's caused the changes we witness in the climate system. So here's just one snippet of the sort of things you can do with these climate models. This shows a time series from 1860 through to near present of globally average temperature from three different sources. The black line you've already seen, that's the observed temperature record with the warming towards the end and lots of bumps and wiggles in between. And then there are two coloured, uh, a red line and a blue line. These are the results taken from many, many models, both the last, most recent generation of models and the second 
most recent generation of models. And you can see that these models have been forced in a very special way. Sorry, they've been, in these models, we only include the influence of natural processes. So we include the influence of volcanic eruptions, and we include the influence of solar variability. We don't include the influence of increases in greenhouse gases. And so if you do that, you can see that the degree to which the models are able to simulate the observed record uh, is deficient. That's if you only include natural processes. By the way, the yellow traces are from individual models. Each individual model will have its own internal variability. With these sorts of simulations, and with projections which we'll come to later, we don't try to predict the phasing of individual naturally occurring, internally driven changes to the climate system. So for example, in the real world, in a particular year, let's say 82, 83, the world has experienced one of the largest El Ninos on record. Whereas in the models, some of them will have El Nino, some of them will have La Ninas, and some of them will be in a neutral state. So that's one part of the equation which we're not trying to replicate. So we don't, as climate scientists, to expect to replicate year to year, and even in some of the behavioural changes that depend upon this internal naturally occurring variability. But what happens now if we include, in addition to the natural processes, greenhouse gas increases and increases in other greenhouse gases, uh, sorry, it's carbon dioxide increases and other uh, greenhouse gases as well as other radiatively active uh, aerosols. You can see that all of a sudden the models do much, much better at rep replicating what's actually been observed. And one of the important things it does is to replicate the accelerated warming that we've seen over the last 50 years or so. But again, you'll notice that collectively the models don't capture these year-to-year -year fluctuations and we don't expect them to. But you'll notice that within the cloud of uncertainty, reflected by the yellow uh, lines, for example, the observed pattern tends to fit within that range of possibilities. So that what this illustrates is that the models are replicating changes due to these externally forced processes like volcanoes, solar variability, greenhouse gases, but they're not replicating the exact timing of the internal process like El Nino and Nino. So that's the history from, geologic, uh, from over 800,000 years to um, present. Let's now focus more on what's been happening over the last 10, 15 years, primarily because this has been I'm receiving an enormous amount of attention in the media. Uh, and some people have been referring to the feature here that you can see at the end of the plot where the observed temperature is below the model mean. Some models capture it, some don't. The model mean is above the observed. So what might be going on there? Well, some people have been referring to this as a hiatus. However, it's important to note that it's a hiatus in one particular statistic. Whereas for many of the features of the climate system, there hasn't been any hiatus at all. So for example, the world has continued to be anomalously warm. So the temperature of the world didn't drop back down to pre-industrial values. It's still at near record values. Second, as I pointed out before, the de first decade of the 21st century is the warmest decade in the incremental record. Uh, third, as I mentioned previously, each of the last three decades has been warmer than the preceding decade. And furthermore, sea level has also risen over this same period, trended upwards. And as has deep ocean heat content, the amount of heat in the deep ocean. So there are, and finally, one other thing which is a bit closer to home is that we've just seen in the last few days Australia reset its record for 12 consecutive months. And the new record is very, very substantial compared with the old record. So you might ask on the basis of all of this information, what, hi what hiatus is it that people are talking about? Well, specifically what they're talking about is the trend in one particular thing, which is global mean surface temperature uh, over the period 1998 to 2012. And you can see that that trend is lower than the trend over a longer period. Why might that be the case? Well, this is something that uh, the authors of the IPCC looked at very carefully. Before we do that, it's also important to note that there are many, there are other periods when 
we had 15 year trends that didn't represent the trend over much longer periods. So it's a little bit of a, a it can be a misleading thing to, to look at a trend over such a short period. Nevertheless, it's an interesting question, and so the IPCC report addresses it, and it concludes that this relatively slow trend in global mean surface temperature is due to a combination of factors. If you like, it's a little bit of a perfect storm of three different elements. One is associated with this internal variability. It turned out that from internal processes alone, there's been, been a cooling that's helped to offset the warming that would have occurred uh, from anthropogenic forcing. The second factor is that as part of that internal variability, some of the heat has moved from the surface, where it would have heated the atmosphere, through to the deep ocean. And also there's been a cooling trend in association with changes in volcanic activity. And similarly, there's also been a cooling trend over that 15 year period associated with a reduction in the amount of radiation the Earth receives from the sun. So you put all of these things together, and it tends to try and offset not completely successfully, but offset the warming that would have occurred had the anthropogenic forcing shone through. So that's the recent past. Uh, the other point that should be made when you look at this plot is how looking using recent trends is a very poor guide to projecting what might happen next. And you can see, for example, if you use uh, these, look at these couplets. So if you use the blue trend, the trend in one of the blue circles, to predict what was going to happen to the trend in the red circles, you'd be, you do a pretty hopeless job. There must be a better way of projecting climate. And thankfully, we have a much better way, and that's through the use of these climate models. But the climate models need to be told what's going to happen to emissions, or what's going to happen to greenhouse gases, or what's going to happen to the concentration of greenhouse gases in order for them to tell us what's going to happen to temperature, rainfall, sea level, and so on. And so in the IPCC report, a great deal of emphasis is given to scenarios which are referred to as RCPs, or representative concentration pathways. These RCPs, each and every one, provide detailed, quantified scenarios for a range of different things, including radiative forcing, which is a technical term climate scientists use for, it's a measure of how hard we're hitting the climate system on the head. The larger we hit, the more forcefully we hit, the larger the changes will be. Uh, it also provides information on the atmospheric concentrations of various gases, including carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane, as well as CFCs, for the period 2006 through to 2100. And it also includes quantified information on how land use change may evolve over the coming century. Now these labels, 2.6, 4.5, they're measures of that radiative forcing in 2100. So they're measures of how hard we're going to be hitting the climate system. The larger the number, the harder we hit. These scenarios are representative because if you look at the peer-reviewed scientific literature, there are many, many different sorts of scenarios, but these are representative of, of a vast majority, of the vast majority of those scenarios. But it's important to note that these scenarios aren't necessarily exhaustive. We know, for example, that there are other scenarios in which sulfate aerosols are uh, emissions of sulfate aerosols aren't reduced as rapidly as they are in these particular scenarios. So what happens if you then take these scenarios, I should point out that, um, uh, that with these scenarios, some of them vary, as I mentioned before, with the degree to which we apply radiative forcing. They vary within their regard to the amount of CO2, for example, in the atmosphere. So for 8.5, the emissions of CO2, or the concentrations, are much, much higher than they are for RCP 2.6. That's the blue one down the bottom here. So you get a whole range of different answers. That's because no one knows for sure what emissions are going to be doing over the coming century. And so they're all projections giving, given a scenario. And this scenario, RCP 2.6, assumes that they are going to be very, very, they are consistent with there being stringent emissions controls on a global basis. And in some models, in order to reach these sorts of uh, low concentrations, you need to have, you need to develop technologies that are able to actually extract greenhouse gases from the atmosphere on a massive scale. 
course, such technologies don't currently exist. So you might regard that particular scenario as a fingers crossed scenario. However, you won't find any statement like that at all in the IPCC report because the IPCC report doesn't provide any information on which of these is more likely and it doesn't prescribe what we should be doing. It just tries to give you the information you need to make your decision. So what the IPCC report then goes on to say is that if you want to keep global temperature change below, let's say, 2 degrees Celsius relative to pre-industrial, then a range of things need to occur. One of the new features of this report relative to old, older reports is that it highlights that primarily the future warming that we're going to experience is driven by the total amount of carbon dioxide emitted if you add it up all the way back to the industrial, say, 1750, 1760. So it's not the emissions in a particular year, either past or future, it's the accumulation over that whole period. And as a rough estimate, it seems as if you want, if you want to keep global temperature change below 2 degrees Celsius, then you can't emit, or we can't emit, more than 1,000 gigatons of carbon. Of course, the situation is not quite as simple as that because this simple formula doesn't take into account some of the other greenhouse gases. Um, so this number could be as low as 800 gigatons of carbon. You think, well, what's a gigaton? How does that relate to what we've already done? Well, since the Industrial Revolution, we've already emitted approximately 531 gigatons of carbon. So in other words, more than half. And this doesn't include the 2012-2013 nor does it, in, uh, and the other important point to note is that currently our emissions are around about 10 gigatons of carbon per year, but that, that rate of emission is increasing around about 3% per year. So you can imagine that if, taking all of those things into account, if we assume that we've been given a budget of 1,000 gigatons of carbon, say, then we, we would exhaust that budget uh, within a few decades. So in order, if we actually did exhaust it in terms of emissions, then we would actually need to rely upon these massive new technologies. And of course, they would have to be safe um, and effective. But as I said, such technologies have yet to be developed. And the other important point to note about these budgets is that they don't incorporate other factors which are very important. One, for example, is if there was a further permafrost, permafrost thaw. Permafrost is frozen soils, primarily in the Arctic, and in those frozen soils are locked up a lot of greenhouse gases, methane, carbon dioxide. There's already been some thawing of that permafrost, uh, and more thawing is expected. But what we don't know is how much greenhouse gas is going to be emitted by that continued forming. It may be as little as 50 gigatons of carbon over the century, or maybe it will be 250 gigatons of carbon or more. And so it's important to keep those sorts of issues in mind when you look at a plot like this, because that plot doesn't incorporate that kind of possibility. Now, that, those amounts, those budget, that budget of 1,000 gigatons of carbon, that's if you want to keep the likelihood of temperature change of two degrees Celsius below uh, below two degrees Celsius lighter. You want to make it lighter. Suppose you want to make it very light. Suppose you want to make it extremely light. Light. Then the budget will be much less, much much less. Now, of course, not only is temperature going to be increased, there'll be a whole host of associated changes, and some of, and we'll see, for example. Increased, further increases in sea level at rates that have that were surpassed what we've already observed. And again, crucially, we will see more rapid sea level rise under this RCP 8.5 scenario than we would under the RCP 2.6. But even under that RCP 2.6 scenario, we see sea level, further sea level rise. And it's important to remember that we remember before we were talking about how through increasing concentration of greenhouse gases, we've really been banging the climate system on the head. Well, the climate system takes a while to respond to the forcing, to the hitting we've already given. It doesn't come to a steady state overnight. It takes centuries and centuries. 
And so even if we were able to magically go back to the year 2000, for example, freeze concentrations at that level, there would still be further warming and there would still be substantial further sea level rise, not just this century, but for centuries beyond. Now, we've also been receiving uh, very, two very important services, if you like, from the ocean. And those services are that the ocean has been absorbing a significant fraction of the carbon dioxide that we've been emitting. Now that, and it also has been absorbing a significant fraction, a very large fraction of the heat. So they're two very useful things. But unfortunately, those services, as Steve Green Tool was saying the other day, come at an extreme cost. One is from the heat, it's a contribution to sea level rise. The other, from absorbing carbon dioxide, is ocean acidification. Uh, some of you are we're obviously all aware that liquids can be either acidic, basic, or neutral, and the ocean is basic, but it's becoming less basic, and this has been given because it's uptaking, absorbing carbon dioxide. And that process has been termed ocean acidification. So the sort of evidence that we've just looked at, and much, much, other, much, much more evidence, led the IPCC authors to the following conclusions. First, that atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide, and should I also add nitrous oxide and methane, are unprecedented in the 800,000 year record. Warming of the climate system is unequivocal. 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 Uh, and your influence on climate is clear. Global mean sea level will continue to rise during the 21st century. Uh, and warming through some of the processes that we talked about through this, um, through the thawing, the permafrost thawing, for example, will lead to, potentially lead to further increases in carbon dioxide release and further warming. A vicious cycle, if you like. And finally, that substantial and sustained reductions in global emissions of greenhouse gases are required, if that's what the world chooses to do, to limit warming to, for example, less than 2 degrees Celsius relative to what we had prior to the industrial era. Thank you.